Well, hey everyone, if you're new here, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff here at Hope. And I want to know, how many of you love springtime? Because that means baseball season is here. How many baseball fans are... (laughs) Now, here's what's surprising to me about the baseball season. (laughs) If you had told me two weeks ago that the Brewers would be leading their division, I wouldn't have been surprised. But if you had told me that the Brewers would have been four and a half games ahead of their division rivals, the Cubs, I think that would have been surprising, right? (laughs) Or or what what if six months ago? What if six months ago someone had told you, you know what? the Milwaukee Bucks will have the best record in the NBA this season. Now, now you might have, you right, okay, fine, go ahead. (laughs) You better cheer for Jesus later. That's all I'm going to say, all right? You're like, yeah, Brewers, Mm mm-hmm, Jesus, okay. Now, now if you said, you know, if someone said the Bucks will make the playoffs this year, that probably wouldn't have surprised you, but the best record, I mean, better than teams like Golden State and all that, I think that's surprising. Now, Your reaction to the surprise depends a lot on your values, your beliefs, your assumptions. If you are a Milwaukee team sports fan, you're you're cheering at those surprises. If if you cheer for another team, then maybe it's not so awesome. I don't know. But but you know, when surprises in life happen, you know, our our reaction to those surprises really is based on what we already believe or what we already value or what we already assume. Well, uh, this series, uh, we're taking a look at the life of a man by the name of Jonah, and today we're in part five of a six-part series. And uh, to be honest, Jonah is a book of many surprises. It's a story of many surprises. The, the surprises start right away in chapter 1 when, when God says, Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. And the reason why that's surprising is because Nineveh was a terrorist state. They were a violent people. They had a mission in life, and it was to take over other territories, other cities, other nations, and not just conquer them, but annihilate them. Uh, torture people, rape women and children. It was just this vile terrorist organization. And God says to Jonah, his own prophet, I want you to go to these wicked, evil, violent people, and I want you to preach my word to them. Now, we, we lose the impact of that, but in that generation, people would have said, are you kidding me? They're evil. They're bad. We want God to judge them. We don't want God to send his word to them. We want God to judge them. Now, the second surprising thing about Jonah, if you haven't been with us so far in the series, is that God sent Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh. Jonah was a patriot. Jonah was a nationalist. I mean, what we see in his personalities, he he really went all the way, a very partisan to nationalism, a toxic nationalism. And we read between the lines, we're even led to assume that Jonah was a racist. And God told Jonah, I want you to go to these foreign people who are a threat to your people, to your country, and you go and preach my word to them. And of course, the third surprising thing we've seen in the story so far is Jonah's response. Okay, God, what I'm hearing you say is you want me to go to those people and preach your word to them. Is that right? No. Just just straight up. No, I'm not going to do it. And instead of going to do what God asked him to do, Jonah ran in the opposite direction. And this is why we're studying the book of Jonah. Since Jonah was a man who ran away from God, that makes his story your story. And that makes his story my story. Because all of us at different seasons and in different ways in our life have decided, I'm going to run away from God. Now, you might not have framed it that way. But for some of us, it was that direct and that obvious. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were taught values and you learned right from wrong, or you grew up going to church and you learned the Ten Commandments, but then you got to a place in life, you got to an opportunity in life, you got to a relationship in life where you just said no, and you did the opposite of what God asked you to do, and you just directly on purpose ran away from God. Or maybe it was, you know, not quite that overt. Maybe for you, uh, you have a conscience. Everybody has a conscience. And, and what you did, you got to a place in life where, you know, you, you didn't really think about God or how God might react to it. But what you decided to do in a season of life, you knew it was wrong in your own heart. 
you knew you were doing the wrong thing, and you just decided, but I'm going to do it anyway. And you ran away from God. Well, that's what Jonah did. He said, God, I hear what you're telling me to do, and I just don't want to do it right now. I'm, I'm not saying I'm arguing about it on ethical basis. I'm just saying, no, I'm, I'm getting as far away from you as I can. So he got in a boat, and he sailed as far away from God and as far away from the city of Nineveh as he could. And when he sailed away, a storm overtook the boat, and the sailors understood this is something that is supernatural in origin. They discovered Jonah's the cause behind it. They said, what did you do? And he says, guys... It's not you, it's me. And he said, God's getting me. If you throw me in the water, the storm will die down and you'll be spared. So they threw him in the water and then the storm grew completely calm. I think that was pretty surprising. I mean, dead calm, just Jonah's bobbing there in the water. And then uh, the big surprise, of course, came when a fish showed up and swallowed Jonah and he had a three-day timeout in the belly of a fish where he could think about what he'd done. And from the belly of the fish, Jonah cried out to the Lord in repentance. Now, Jonah so far has learned a couple of critical lessons in life. And these are lessons that we can either learn the easy way or the hard way. And you know, my prayer is that we would learn it the easy way because that's how life works. We either learn by our consequences or we learn through the consequences of others. You get to choose which one you learn from. They, you know, consequence doesn't care. You can learn from your own or for someone else's. But here's what Jonah learned so far. Number one, you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. If you decide, I am going to run away from God, he'll let you. He won't stop you. If you don't want to be there, he'll let you go. If you don't want to do that, he'll let you disobey. He will let you run as far away as your little legs can carry you. If you want to run from God, he will let you run. But just so you know, you can't outrun God. God is kind of everywhere. God sees everything. God knows all things. And wherever you run away from, you will still be under the watchful eye of God. You can run from God, but you can't outrun God. And the second thing Jonah learned is that God is generous in his grace. He really is a God who is gracious. He is full of compassion and patience and mercy and forgiveness. He's generous in his grace. And at the same time, he is thorough in his discipline. When we stray, when we run away, God will discipline us and he will often do it with great thoroughness, but he's not doing it to pay you back and he's not doing it to get you back. He's doing it to bring you back because when we run away from God, we run away, listen, we run away from the experience of his love. We run away from the experience and assurance of his presence and his will for our lives and that only hurts us when we run away from God, eventually the consequences of our rebellion catch up to us and they hurt us and they hurt the people we love. So because God is compassionate, because God is generous in his grace, he will thoroughly discipline us not to get us. He got Jesus. Jesus paid for your sin. In God's economy, when he looks at your sin, there's nothing to pay for. Jesus paid for it. But he's like, you're running away from my grace. I want to bring you back to bless you. So you can live life with a clean conscience. So you can live a life of wisdom and my blessing. And all of this falls under the great theme of the book of Jonah, which Jonah is still struggling to grasp. And if Jonah, a man who was a prophet of God, a man who worked for God, if he struggled to understand this lesson, I think a lot of us struggle to understand it as well. Here's the central theme that we're learning in this book, that God's grace is deeper than the ocean. The compassion, the love, the mercy, the kindness, the forgiveness that God has for you and for the world is deeper than the ocean. And that's good news because not one of us is beyond the need of God's grace in our own lives. All of us need God's grace. And it's good news because that means not one of us is beyond the reach of God's grace. And no one in this world is beyond the need of God's grace. And no one in this world is beyond the reach of God's grace. And the theme of this entire narrative is that God's grace is deeper than the ocean. Now, 
The biggest surprise we come to so far is what we get to today in chapter 3. Uh, Jonah's story is four chapters long. We've covered two chapters so far. Last time we saw Jonah was swallowed by the fish. He repented. He was spat out on the shore by the fish. And we would think to ourselves, well, that should be the end of the story, right? I mean, because that's all we remember of it. There's this giant whale of a tail, and it swallows Jonah, and he gets spit out, and then that's the end of it, right? No, that's only the halfway point. We just got to the intermission. But he still doesn't understand this big idea that God's grace is deeper than the ocean. And because he still doesn't understand that, uh, we continue with the story of Jonah. We're in chapter 3, right after the fish has vomited Jonah out onto the shore. Jonah 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, this, I think, is more shocking than anything we've seen so far. Think about it. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the first time. Jonah said, no, God should pull a Homer Simpson on him. Why, you little, and just start getting him, right? He's a failure. He's a wash-up. God should be done with this guy. He is godless. He has run away. If, if God were the God that I thought God was growing up, he should say, you're, you're not worthy. You're not good enough to play on my team anymore. Jonah, you're on the bench. Who's up next? Micah, Nahum, who's up? Hey, you go to Nineveh and preach my word against it. Jonah, for the rest of time, you are going to be nothing but a bad example of what happens when people run away from me. And because you're a bad example, I'm done with you. That's not what God does. He takes this failure. He takes this sinner. He takes this has-been. And he says... I've got a mission for you still. Even though you said no, I still have a mission for you. Even though you said no, I still have a purpose for you. You see, when we fail in our spiritual lives, when we sin, that might disqualify us from certain social circles. But it does not disqualify us from God's circle. It does not disqualify us from God's plan and purpose that he has for your life. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And he said, go, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. God has a sending mission for Jonah. Jonah, I want you to go. I still have, in spite of your sin, a purpose and plan for your life. What Jonah didn't realize initially was how desperately he needed God's purpose and God's mission in his life. And I can say that because all of us need a bigger purpose and a bigger mission in our lives than just living for ourselves. We're hardwired to need that. All of us, when we were children, we were enamored by stories and fairy tales and movies that talked about adventure, a quest, a dragon to slay, a big noble purpose that was so much bigger than who we were. There's something in our soul, there's something in our heart that resonates with that. It's what we were made to be. But somehow when we become adults, we live in a culture that teaches us to do nothing more than work on paying our bills and saving up for our next vacation. And somehow that becomes our primary purpose in life. Find find someone to be in a relationship with, pay your bills, and save up for your next vacation. But God made us for something bigger than that. God made us to live with a strong sense of a compelling mission and purpose in our lives. My question for you is, do you have that? What I'm not talking about is you have a conscience, so so you give a few dollars to charities here and there because you have a conscience. You volunteer some time here and there because you have a conscience. That's not what I mean. And I'm not even asking you if you believe in God. I'm not asking you if you have a Christian, but I'm asking you, do you have a purpose for living that is so compelling that you would give your life for it? That's what I'm asking you. Do you have a mission in life that is so gripping and is so compelling and it is so worthwhile that it is worth you laying down your life to have, to continue to advance? If you don't have that, there will be a perpetual emptiness rattling around in your soul because you were made for that. And many of us know uh, the comedian and actor Jim Carrey. Uh, What you might not know was that uh, when Jim Carrey grew up in Canada, he grew up in extreme poverty. In fact, there was a stretch of his childhood when his whole family lived in a Volkswagen van parked on a relative's front lawn. 
When he was in school, he would work eight-hour shifts at the factory every day after school just to help his family make ends meet. Well, as soon as Jim was old enough, he moved to Hollywood in hopes of making it big with his comedy and becoming famous and becoming wealthy and escaping everything from his past poverty. And before he was a known celebrity or actor, in 1990, he drove his car up a hill overlooking Hollywood. And he dreamed of someday being famous. He dreamed of someday being rich. He dreamed of someday delighting audiences everywhere and making them laugh and forget about their worries for a while. And as he dreamed about everything he wanted to be, he wrote himself a check for $10 million. And he was broke as a joke. He wrote himself a check for $10 million. He, in the memo, he said, for acting services rendered. And he dated it five years in the future. He folded up the check, he put it in his wallet, and he continued to chase his dream and his purpose to become that kind of comedian, to become that kind of actor who delighted audiences everywhere and was paid handsomely for it. And then in 1994, everything changed for Kerry. His first breakthrough film, Ace Ventura, all righty then, broke through and it was a blockbuster and people loved him. In the middle of 1994, The Mask was released, which was also a blockbuster. And then at the end of 1994, one of the greatest contributions to intellectual cinema ever released, Dumb and Dumber, smashed records for comedy movies. And by the end of 1994, Jim Carrey was the highest paid actor in Hollywood, making $20 million a film and everything he he dreamed of and aspired to, and the joy he wanted to bring to millions of people came to fruition. It all happened. He achieved it all. And here's what he said. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. What are you living for? What has gripped your life? Jonah was not living for any purpose bigger than his own interests, and his own interests were that his nation would be powerful. His partisan nationalism was his interest. And when the call of God competed with his truest interest and his greatest love, his idolatry was exposed. Because he would not obey the call of God, he followed his truest idol. What transformed Jonah from this idolater into the most powerful force in a generation? Because eventually, with this time, Jonah would go to the city of Nineveh, and it was a powerful city. It was the most powerful military force on the planet. No armies even dreamed of occupying Nineveh. Nobody dreamed of laying siege, but Jonah did what no army in the world could do. He brought the entire city of Nineveh to its knees. And the reason why he did that wasn't because he laid siege to Nineveh, but it was because God laid siege to Jonah. And he brought two powerful factors to bear in the life of Jonah. And if you pay attention, God is bringing the same two powerful forces to bear in your life today. What were the two powerful forces that changed Jonah into the most powerful man in a generation that God is trying to do in your life today? Here they are. First one is this. God's relentless grace God's relentless, never stopping, never quitting, never giving up grace. God's relentless grace. Was Jonah disqualified? Yes. Was he a failure? Yes. Should God have thrown him aside? Yes. And what does God do? He calls him again. I still have a purpose for you, Jonah. Not because of who you are, but because of who I am. And God loves to do this all the time. God loves to take the people who have failed. God loves to take the people who have sinned. God loves to take the people who ran away and said, now, finally, I can use you to do true good in the world. Now, why would that be? Why does God always call people like that to make a difference? Think of what Jesus did in his life. With his 12 disciples, the loudmouth disciple was Peter. 
And right before Jesus was crucified, Peter was boasting about Peter. And he said, Jesus, even if everyone abandons you, I'm never going to. I'm loyal to the end. I'm your boy, Jesus. I'm with you to the end. And not 12 hours later, Peter not only denied ever knowing Jesus, he cursed Jesus saying, I don't know who he is. Stay away from me. I have nothing to do with him. And he failed. And what did Jesus do with Peter? He put him in charge of the whole enterprise. Or think of a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. Uh, After Jesus, Paul was the most influential person in the history of Christianity because he took the message of the resurrection, that Christ died for our sins and he rose on the third day, and he is the one who single-handedly took it throughout the entire Roman Empire, planting all kinds of churches, spreading the news of Easter all around the Mediterranean Rim. Why was Paul qualified to do that? Look what he said in his own words. 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul said, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, dash, of whom I am the worst. Now, this is not just, ah, shucks, I'm nobody. This is not false humility. Paul meant it. When it comes to the whole category of sinners, I'm number one, baby. And the reason why he could say that was because before he followed Jesus, He murdered Christians. He was convinced Jesus was the enemy, and he had Christians who were running around saying Jesus rose from death, thrown in prison, persecuted, executed. He was single-handedly trying to stomp out the church until he met Jesus, who was resurrected. And then he realized, I'm the worst person in the world. Jesus is the Son of God. He did rise from death, and here I am killing the people who are telling the truth about God and changing people's eternal destinations, and I'm trying to stop it. I'm trying to keep people away from God. I'm trying to keep people away from hell, and I'm killing them in order to do it. I am number one on the worst sinner list. This is not false humility. He's saying, I was a scumbag. I was a failure. I was running away from God as hard as I could. He continues. But for that very reason, what reason that I am number one on the sinner list? For that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. In other words, Paul said the reason why God called me is not because I was good. The reason why God called me is because I am a walking billboard to let the entire world know that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. And if he has patience and mercy on me, you are not disqualified from the kingdom of God. And if God has a purpose and a mission for my life, there is no one who can say, I'm damaged goods. There is no one who can say, I failed too badly. There's no one who can say, but Jason, you don't understand. God can't use me for a good purpose. I'm divorced. I crashed the car. My adult kids don't speak to me. I failed. I'm a sinner. I'm not qualified. You're the preacher. You do all that preaching stuff. I'm disqualified. I'm not worthy. You don't understand that God's grace is deeper than the ocean. And many times God does not use people in a powerful way until they have already become failures because that's how God shows the real power is not from us. The real power is from Him. And He is a God who is merciful and gracious and compassionate and patient with you. That's who He is. And God brought His relentless grace to bear on the life of of Jonah, a man who failed, and God said, but I still have a purpose for you, and your sin does not disqualify you from my purpose for you. Your sin does not disqualify you for the mission I have for you. And if you're taking notes, that's our first big idea today. God's grace leverages your failures to make you useful. See, it's easy for people who become Christians and they don't have great failures to become hypocrites. Well, I'm so good. Why can't you all be good like me? Why can't you all be godly like me? It's the failures who have received so much grace from God. We say, yeah, God's really good. You should meet him. He's changed my life. 
And it's not about me. I know how much I need grace. And God's a God who has so much of it. However, this does not happen automatically. Your failures and your sins and your shortcomings don't automatically make you useful in the kingdom of God. There's something that we're going to get to in a minute, but I'll tell you what it is now. It's repentance. It's humility. Repenting of sin, repenting of the failures we cause by running away from God is what God will use and leverage to make us useful in His kingdom. But listen, your sin might disqualify you from some circles. It does not disqualify you from God's purpose and God's mission and for living for something that is so much bigger than you. That's the first thing God brought to bear in the life of Jonah. Some of you are thinking, don't we have nine more verses to get to? Quiet. Second thing God brings to bear in the life of Jonah, God's relentless grace is the first one. Second one, God's relentless calling. God's relentless calling. He called Jonah once. Jonah said, no, he keeps calling. He keeps after him. And this is what God does. He calls us and he calls us and he calls us to something greater than ourselves. You see this all over the Bible. If you look at the life of Abraham in the Old Testament, God called Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house and your country and I want you to go to a new place. And Abraham said, where? And God said, I'll tell you when you get there. And God said to Abraham, who was an old man, Abraham, you're going to have a son, and he's going to bless the world. And Abraham said, how? And God said, Abraham, just trust me. I'll take care of it. And then God said to Abraham, after he had a son, I want you to climb up the mountain with your son Isaac, whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him to me there. And Abraham said, why? And God said, I want you to trust me that I will do this for you. And so Abraham, the man of faith, trusted God's calling and obeyed it. And Abraham is a man that 4,000 years later, people around the world look back to as a forefather of their faith because he obeyed the calling of God in his life by trusting God. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that the reason why Abraham was able to do this is because he looked beyond his temporary life at the things people live for. And he put his hope and his confidence in the city that was yet to come, the city of heaven. And he realized everything around me in this world is temporary. My home is temporary. My wealth is temporary. My work is temporary. My family is temporary. The city of God lasts forever. And he was obedient to the call of God. God is a God who calls. He calls you in to send you out. Look at Jesus. Jesus is in heaven, and God the Father says to God the Son, go, I have a mission for you. And Jesus left the Father's home. He came to this earth on mission to give his life, to pay for the sins of the world. God is a God who calls. God is a God who sends. And for those of us in the room who are Christians, and if you're not a Christian, we respect that you're not there yet. We're just glad you're here. You're learning a little bit about what it means to follow Jesus today. For those of us who do follow Jesus, you have been called by God to live in your life a purpose that is larger than you. You have been called and given a purpose and mission by God that is bigger than find someone to marry, pay my bills, and save money for my next vacation. You've been called to change people's lives and change people's eternal destinations. That's what you have been called by God to do. This is not something for pastors. This is something for people who have been baptized. If you've been baptized, that was your ordination into ministry in the kingdom of God. I preach, that might not be what you do, but you have a role to play and you have a mission from God, whatever you do for a living, because of God's relentless calling. And that's the second thing that God brought to bear on the life of Jonah. God's grace blesses you to send you. God's grace blesses you to send you. The reason why God blesses you is that he might send you to make a difference in this world for eternity. That's why God gives Christians blessings. Now the question comes up, I'll keep this part short. How do you know what God is calling you to do with your life? How do you know, I mean, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That was pretty specific. Go to Nineveh. This is my plan for you, okay? Most of us, we don't hear a voice from God. If you do, double check it with someone, all right? Just 
you know, it'd be, be cool. Double check it with someone, but, but we don't, it doesn't work that way for us. How do we know what God calls us to do? First of all, in the big end of the funnel, Jesus said to the church, go and make disciples of all nations. If you are part of the church, if you follow Jesus, if you say Jesus forgave my sins when he died on the cross and rose on the third day, that is a purpose that is worth giving your life for. That's part of following Jesus. He blesses you to send you to make a difference in the life of others. Now, if you have no idea where to get started with that, and if you're just you're kind of spinning your tires saying, what do I do? Here's where you start. When someone comes along and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, would you like to volunteer to be a blessing to someone else? That's God calling you. Here's an opportunity to do good and get out of a purpose that is just about you and start living a purpose for God. Someone taps you on the shoulder and says, here's an opportunity to financially support something that is making a difference. That's God's calling. It's a chance to start doing something with your money that's not all about you. It's about other people and it's about God. Maybe for some of you, it's a little further along than that. There has been this nagging sense, almost a voice in your head of what you are supposed to do next, an opportunity God has put in your path, and you just can't get away from it. You try and ignore it, but it comes back in front of you, this opportunity to go do something good that is bigger than you. This is my story of why I'm on this stage today. Some of you have heard it. I was a pastor in Boise, Idaho, which is a beautiful place, and I highly recommend living there. But I didn't want to move to Wisconsin. I wasn't looking for a job in Wisconsin. I wasn't looking for a job anywhere when a a call, literally a telephone call, came to me from someone at this church saying, hey, we want you to come and pastor this church. We, We got your name from someone else and blah, blah, blah. And I said, thanks. I'm really happy where I'm at, but it wouldn't leave me alone. And I said, God, I'm happy here. And you know what God said? Nothing. He didn't say anything. It was so frustrating. God, I'm I'm happy here. I'm content here. My life is good here. I have a church I love here. I, I love living in this city. God, why don't you leave me alone? And God wouldn't leave me alone. I couldn't get away from this idea. So then I took it the next step. I started asking people, around me who are mature spiritually, am I crazy because I'm starting to get a sense God is calling me to do this. So I I talk to people who are over on this end. They're like, yeah, Jason, I think you're supposed to be here. It looks like a fit. And I I talk to people, you know, who had nothing to do with it. They're like, Jason, it it looks like a good fit. Maybe you're supposed to go. I talk to people at my former church and I said, what do you guys think? And they said, oh yeah, you should probably go to this new church. I think they're going to love you there, right? No, of course, they said, no, you should stay. Don't, don't go there. But when I, the, when I talk to neutral people who are mature Christians, like, you know, it looks like God's calling you here. So if you've got something nagging you and you can't put it down, bounce it off some mature people. Get some confirmation. Because don't, don't base your feelings, don't, don't equate your feelings with God's call, all right? Those are two different things. When you, when you just follow your feelings, you don't check that with anyone who's spiritually mature. That's on you. But God won't let you get away from it. He will keep hassling you like he did Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and said, go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it. Here's what happened. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. I wrote in my notes, I bet he did. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it, which is kind of interesting. Three days in the fish, three days in Nineveh. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. An eight-word sermon. Five words in Hebrew. An eight-word sermon. Don't get any ideas. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. It's just an external way of showing, hey, we're we're in a season of repentance here. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That was astonishing for the people of Nineveh, that the king, the supreme dictator, would go to that great length. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. 
But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Remember, the message was 40 days and you're done. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. That was the sermon. He said, maybe God, if we repent, maybe God will spare us. If we turn away from our wickedness, if we all as a city turn away from our violence, maybe God will be patient with us. Now, that's astonishing, okay? This massive city, these pagan people, this incredibly violent culture, all of them turning to God like that. What's going on here? Well, history tells us there are some other things going on in world events at that time. Uh, for starters, we know that about this time, three tribes about 100 miles from Nineveh banded together and started to form an army. Maybe that started to make them nervous. Uh, we know that uh, around this period, uh, in a five-year period, two plagues ripped through the city of Nineveh, killing thousands of people. Maybe that's coming into play. Maybe it's the fact that this crazy Jew is walking into an Arab city saying, God's going to destroy you. And who knows what Jonah looked like after being in the fish three days and three nights. You know, I imagine he doesn't smell good, but I'll promise you this. Dude's not afraid of anything at this point. I was just in a fish for three days. You think I'm scared of you? 40 more days and you are getting destroyed, buckaroo. See ya, and off he goes. He's not afraid of anything. Whatever it was, there's all these factors, but there's the most powerful factor in play. The most powerful factor in play is this is the word of the Lord. And God's word is powerful. I mean, so many of you, you say, Jason, you know, that message really spoke to me. It's because I'm just reading the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is powerful. It's a sharp, double-edged sword. It pierces our hearts. It pierces our souls. It divides truth from lies that we believe. It is powerful in our lives. This is why as a pastor, one thing I want for everybody is to just read your Bible a few minutes a day. Read the word of the Lord. God has a word to speak to you every single day. So the word of the Lord comes and the entire city repents and it's very powerful. So how do we bring all this home? The key for Nineveh is the same key for us. It was the same key for Jonah. How do we become useful even when we're failures? How do we respond to God's calling? Because let me be clear on this. To fail to respond to the call of God is what Jonah did and he ran away. And when Jonah was spit out of the fish, God did not come to Jonah and say, Hey, sorry, bud. I, I, I got upset. I lost my temper. I overreacted. Listen, why don't I have this fish spit you out on a nice tropical island? We'll put an umbrella drink in your hand for a week. We'll let you recoup, get back on your feet again, wash the slime off. No. Fish spits him out. God says go. Pursuing the mission of God is not for those of us who have extra time. It's not for us who have extra rest. It is not for those of us who have extra money. It is not for those of us who have nothing but free time on our hands. God calls us as we are where we are and says, go and to take our agenda and elevated over God's calling is to run away from God. How does it all turn around? How do we become like Jonah and become the most powerful people in our generation? The answer is repentance. Real quickly, let me give you an overview of what repentance is biblically. Um, the best way I can explain it is there's five C's of repentance. Uh, depending on your church background or what you assume about repentance, it's kind of hard to understand. This makes it real simple. The first C is contrition. That means we're broken inside. We realize not that we've broken God's heart, our rules, we broke God's heart. The God who loves you, the God who made you, the God who's patient for you, the God who has grace that is deeper than the ocean. We, that's the God we said no to. It's contrition. If you feel guilt in your life, that's God being gracious to you. If you feel guilt about what's going on in your life, that's God being patient and gracious to you. Don't, don't turn that off. Don't self-medicate that away. Take the next step with that, which is confession. God, the reason why I feel guilty is because I've been sinning. 
God, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie anymore. The reason why I feel guilty is because I've been running, because I've been saying no to you. I've not been experiencing in my life your love. I've not been experiencing in my life your presence and your joy and your peace, that inner sense of wholeness. I haven't been experiencing that because I've been running from you. I'm going to stop hiding that. I'm going to be honest about that. I'm going to confess that. The third C of repentance, this is the critical one, Christ. I trust that Jesus gave his life on the cross to pay for this very sin. Jesus gave his life on the cross to pay for my rebellion to pay for my foolishness, to pay for my failure, to pay for my selfishness. I believe that Jesus took care of all of that, and you're not mad at me anymore. I might beat myself up. You're not beating me up. I might be angry with myself. You're not angry with me because you love me through Christ. That makes it safe to confess because God's waiting to forgive you, not get you. And then after that, that leads us to correction. Whatever I've done wrong, I want to set it right. I want to make it right. I'll apologize. I'll own it. I'll do what I can to make it right and then finally change. Because I'm a child of God, I want to leave that sin. I want to leave that rebellion. I want to leave that saying no to God and start being obedient to the call of God in my life. Now, here's why this is powerful. Uh, Paul, who wrote about being the worst sinner, wrote this about the power of repentance in 2 Corinthians. He said, godly sorrow brings repentance. And what does repentance do? That leads to salvation. And what does it leave? It leaves no regret. Come on, say this one. What does it leave? If you repent of sins, do you know what lives in your heart? It's not regret. Repenting of sins gets away from regret. It cleans out the regret. It cleans out the guilt. It cleans out the shame. It cleans out the past. That's the power of repentance. Trusting in Christ like that, living a new life, the regret's gone. Repentance is cleansing. Repentance feels good. But worldly sorrow, that's being sorry you got busted. That's being sorry you're living with the consequences of your sin. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Repentance changes everything. And when Jonah repented, he became a world changer. And when Nineveh repented, well, what happened? Get to the last verse. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction He had threatened because God's grace is deeper than the ocean. So here's the final thing I want to leave you guys with today. Since God's grace is deeper than the ocean, of what is he inviting you to repent? Here's what I'm willing to bet. As you've been sitting here this morning, there's already been a little bit of contrition starting in your heart. God kind of poking at that thing where you've been running, where you've been saying no, where you've been ignoring his will. Don't ignore that. That is God's grace calling you back to repent of sin, to trust in Christ, confess it to him, trust in Christ, and lead a new life. And it leaves no regret. It is the freest way to live your life. Of what is God calling you to repent? And second, where is he calling you to go? The reason why God blesses you is to send you. The reason why God calls you in is to send you out and live for a purpose that is bigger than you. To live for a purpose that lasts longer than your life on earth. What sin is he calling you to repent of? Where is he calling you? you to go. I want you to think about that this week. And next Sunday, we're going to wrap up the story of Jonah with the most surprising thing possible. But in two weeks from today, it's Easter Sunday. Two weeks from today, we are moving the entire church to the Economy Walk Art Center in order to have enough empty chairs to invite everyone we can to hear the power, the life-changing power of Easter Sunday because Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live, and that's what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. That's what we cheer about on Easter Sunday, right? 
And the reason why we have three services at a larger venue is so that you can invite people and be on mission with your Father in heaven who wants all people saved. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you again for this amazing story from the life of Jonah. Thank you that you are so gracious because Jonah's story is our story. We've all run from you in different times and in different ways, yet because you are gracious, you invite us back to repent, to confess our sin, to turn it over to you, to leave it at the cross, to lead new lives that leave us feeling cleansed, free from regret, free from shame, free from guilt. Thank you for that freedom. And Lord, you've also called us. For so many of us, if we're honest, you've called us and called us and called us, not just two times like Jonah, but we keep saying no and we keep living lives that are selfish and for us. Help us to see the reason why you call us is because you want something better for us. You want us to lead lives that matter and make a difference. Forgive us for saying no. Open our hearts that whatever you ask of us, Lord, whatever you are calling us to do, we will have the humility and the wisdom to say yes and live lives that change the world. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus.